Warm greetings from CNS. Welcome everyone to this very special webinar which re recognizes major scientific advancement in the form of the launch of the first ever child-friendly TB drugs. And this is surely half the battle won. And now we will also explore the other half which should ensure these drugs reach the children in need globally without any avoidable delays. Thanks to the untiring efforts of TB Alliance and its partners, WHO, Unit Aid, and USID, the world's first appropriate child-friendly fixed-dose combination medicines to treat children suffering from drug-sensitive TB were announced just ahead of the 46th Union World Conference on Lung Health in Cape Town, South Africa. Initial rollout of the new medicines that will be manufactured by the Indian pharmaceutical company McLeod's is expected in early 2016 and would go a long way in improving treatment adherence and survival for the 1 million or children who become ill with TB every year with an estimated 140,000 of them dying every year. Launch of these new anti-TB drugs for children is a major scientific leap but a lot more work is needed to ensure quick access to children in need globally. If we look at the recent past, there has been unacceptable delay in translating scientific achievements into public health gains. For example, female condoms were approved by US FDA in 1992, but yet are not scaled up globally. And unmet need of preventing unintended pregnancies, continues STIs and HIV is also gaping large. Similarly, pre-exposure prophylaxis was approved by US FDA in July to 2012, but we are yet to see its optimal uptake in, other, in our countries. Two new major TB drugs, as all of you know, betaquiline and delaminate, which were major scientific achievements in the TB world, are yet to be fully utilized in evidence-based manner by high burden countries. We do not want these avoidable delays in rollout of child TB friendly drugs. This passing of the baton from scientists to those who roll it out and ensure that these reach all children in need globally must happen as efficiently as possible and that is why we are going to listen and interact with a panel of experts to solve this riddle. Today in this webinar our distinguished panelists are Dr. Cherry Scott Director of Pediatric Programs at TB Alliance, who will tell us what these new first ever child-friendly TB drugs are. Then we have Dr. Luchika Ditu, Executive Director of the Stop TB Partnership. And last but not the least, Dr. Brenda Venning, who heads one of the most important initiatives of Stop TB Partnership, the Global Drug Facility. In 2014 alone, GDF had delivered over 24 million TB treatment courses in 133 countries globally. So GDF has an important role here. Welcome to all the panelists. Before we invite our first panelist for expert comments, please allow me to make a few announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait till the end. Just type your questions in using the chat function or raise your virtual hand which you will see on your screen during the question and answer session. I also humbly request all panelists to please present in time. You have each panelist has about 10 minutes to present so that we have a good time left for question and answers as well. Let us now hear from the experts without any further delay. Dr. Cherry Scott Director of Pediatric Programs from TB Alliance. Over to you, Cheris. Thank you, Shoba. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk this morning. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, so I just wanted to give some information on the products that are being made available currently, but also to give some context, because um, I think that's important to understand how best we can move forward. Uh, to make the, the complete rollout and to get these products to patients as soon as possible. Um, 
So we've known historically that uh, even though TB causes significant death in children, uh, they uh, they're often quite neglected in this space, um, and they often get the most severe forms and fatal forms of TB, yet for, for many years they've been kind of in the shadows, as we would say, um, undiagnosed and untreated. Uh, we've gotten better estimates. A lot of that has happened through collaboration through the project, uh, but currently the estimated uh, number of children that get TB each year is one million. Uh, and the number of children that die from TB each year is 140,000, and that does include now HIV-positive children. Uh, so, and we also know that child TB often hasn't been included in the child health and survival space, even though it causes significant disease. Uh, oftentimes, TB hides within other diseases, or there's co-infection or comorbidities, and TB is often ignored. Uh, so what we had in, a, in the past before we started, before we initiated this project um, with WHO, with UNITAID funding and USAID funding, we had a situation where the guidelines changed uh, to, uh, to basically represent that children are not small adults uh, but actually have unique needs. Uh, so they actually required higher doses of the product or the drugs for TB. Uh, and so there was a kind of issue uh, for, you know, recommendations published around these new guidelines, uh, but the guidance changed and the policy started to change, but the products that to meet that policy did not change. Um, and so that was an issue. And so what you had was a situation of about uh, almost three to four years where, um, and now actually five years, where providers were doing all types of uh, uh, methods to get to the right dosage for their population, for the children that were getting TB uh, in their countries. Uh, so across the globe, you had some using, you know, different products. There are some older, incorrectly dosed products on the market for pediatrics. There were adult medicines. Um, there were just a lot of variety of syrups. Um, and on the next slide, you can just get a sense of how diverse the treatment and how complex the treatment situation was for children over these last several years. Um, in the, in the far left, you have the Philippines, which was using syrups at the time, which um, a lot of people feel that syrups are quite easy to use, but they also present a lot of challenges, especially on the supply side. Uh, they're heavy, they you know, require cold chain, and in addition to that, you can see all the weight bands that are needed to administer, um, so it can get quite convoluted. Uh, and then also in the middle you have South Africa, which is using a mix of adult and pediatric products, but still that requires crushing and breaking of pills by providers and caregivers. And then on the far, you have Thailand that tried to come up with its own solution, but in some areas of the country where they were having pharmacists actually weigh and crush the pills and then provide parents with a solution um, to prepare at home. Uh, so it, it was quite a complex situation. Um, and so, you know, just to sum that up, there is no appropriately dose quality assured child medicines on the market. Um, many providers had to use various methods like I in indicated. Uh, and it, th that becomes very burdensome. And for a six month treatment, um, it can be quite um, uh, quite a responsibility and, 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 and very hard. And I think it, it leads to, it definitely leads to problems with adherence. Uh, and then also the medicines are quite poor tasting. Uh, and and it makes it even more difficult for, for to administer a, a drug to a child. So this inconsistent administration of country country means there is no unified response to the problem. So now we're in a situation where we can, you know, we're, we're, we're very, you know, uh, proud to kind of stand before you and say, yes, we have a manufacturer ready to supply. The products are available. They're globally available through the Global Drug Facility, um, who, has, who has also contributed throughout the project um, and is essential to really have that, what we say, global availability. Um, so we're, the two products are you know, they're fixed dose combinations, so meaning that uh, children don't have to take a multitude of pills, but can take three, you know, uh, all the drugs they need in one pill. 
Um, so uh, the first drug is a three drug for the two month intensive phase, which is rifampicin, 75 milligram isoniazid, 50 milligrams, and perizinamide, 150 milligrams. And then for the four month continuation phase, it's a two drug, rifampicin, and isoniazid. Um, uh, and then also these, the, the, the basic thing to realize and understand about these products are that they are the correct doses, you know, they meet that, rec you know, it makes it easy to administer the doses recommended by the WHO. They're dispersed in liquid, very little bit of liquid um, in, in very short period of time, things like 12 seconds. It's, it's amazing. And then there are a palatable fruit flavors so that a child can easily take them. So this is just kind of a, you know, really just graphically showing you exactly what we what we were before and now what we're going to. So what does it mean now that we have improved TB treatments for children? Uh, that means that, you know, with the right medicines and the right dose, you improve adherence and you do save lives. Uh, so this is a very important step to improving TB treatment for children, but also child survival. Um, and then it also decreases the development of drug-resistant TB. Uh, and, then, and so and, and allow, by allowing children to be cured. Um, then you have simple formulations, which also decrease the burden on healthcare system and enable scale up in treatment. As we know, a lot of our healthcare um, systems are quite overburdened, um, and so any simple solution oftentimes has a huge effect and impact on the lives of those who are working on the front line. So um, we feel that this is definitely a simplified treatment and will definitely help the healthcare system um, to also treat more kids because it's less burdensome, so um, there's a, a, a more opportunity and more time and more um, resources to be able to identify and then also treat more kids. Uh, and then we have child-friendly medicines that improve the lives of children, TB, and their families, and, and that's a kind of uh, obvious in the sense that, you know, TB is a curable disease. There should be no reason that a child who is diagnosed with TB should not be treated effectively for the disease. So we've so we have availability. We have availability. We have you know the ability for supply. Um, but now it's you know that's just one step. I think Shoba you know mentioned that right off the bat that yes it's great we have the drugs available but now the real work begins. Um, so we need to get these um, products available in countries. And the way we're, we're doing that, um, I know Brenda will speak a lot more in detail around kind of the efforts that uh, the Global Drug Facility is doing and the partnership, but um, we are working very closely with all the technical partners, um, including our original um, implementer, WHO, but also Management of Sciences and Health, um, KNCV, other partners, um, the, the union, UNICEF, to, to bring a t about maternal and child linkages, um, and then uh, so many others. Uh, so we really know that this is going to be an effort, um, and we're working with countries uh, to better understand their needs and to make sure there's no hindrances or barriers to getting these products as soon as possible to their population. So we're, there's a lot of people involved, there's a lot of communication happening, um, and we do feel that it's, it's, uh, it's important to really take the time over the next year to make sure that these products actually get into country and get to patients as soon as possible. Um, so we don't want to repeat the same mistakes of the past where there were delays um, in, in getting appropriate treatment for children. So part of our the investment in pediatric TB is also to find a way to make sure that any other products that are needed for children, um, especially the new drugs and regimens going forward, are as soon as possible, um, um, what we say, accelerated into being able to be uh, modified and formulated um, and made available to children. So research uh, investment and research is uh, heavily needed, especially um, uh, a lot with, for, for children, but for, of course for all uh, those who need treatment for TB. So there is a call to action um, that is, has been issued to increase awareness, political will, and resources. 
and we would invite you all to um, actually I'll go back to the funders of course but we would like you all to sign that call to action it's at tvalliance.org sign the call um, and it's very important that you do sign on because we need as many of those um, out there from all sectors from individuals um, to do something and the call to action spells out what you can do um, and everyone has a part to play so we realize that and we're we're fighting for that because it's going to be so important for the children of this world um, and those that are affected by TV so our project funders of course this couldn't have been um, this this wouldn't have been possible without them. And of course, our primary funder was Unitaid. Um, USAID contributed quite a bit as well um, to really get this work started. And then, of course, our, our donors, uh, Australia, um, Ireland, and then the UK, have also um, lent their support to our work. So we have to give them credit. And we hope that that, that slide will increase over the years such that there are even more of those who are ready to invest in this space. So thank you and I'll turn it over to um, the next panelist. Uh, thank you, Cherise. Very well said indeed. Uh, is Luchika there? Luchika, can you hear me? I cannot see her online. Maybe, maybe she's, she's she is not there as yet. So uh, can I invite, meanwhile, can I welcome Dr. Brenda Wenning, who heads the Global Drug Facility at Stop TB Partnership. Brenda, over to you now. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. And um, thanks for the invitation to present in, in this webinar. It's really a, a very exciting time for uh, pediatric TB with the recent launch of the first ever child-friendly formulations in WHO uh, recommended doses. Can you see my screen there? There we go. Um, we're, we're, we're getting you on now. OK. <clears throat> so the webinar title is a good one um, in that it suggests that we are uh, halfway there in terms of reaching our goal and the, the question is what's the other half? And the other half is pretty simple. Uh, it's basically now that we have these formulations we need to get them to the people who need them as quickly as possible. So what needs to happen in order to do that? We need to increase awareness and demand for these products. We need to secure financing. We need to support countries to adopt these new medicines. We need to procure medicines and actually begin the treatment. And we need to manage the market. So I'll quickly go through each of these five key activities. The first one is around uh, increasing awareness of the products and demand for the products. And here we're looking at target audiences of practitioners, care advocates, policymakers, and we're looking at audiences at both global levels and national levels. So we need to launch we need to launch awareness campaigns. Uh, to ensure that these key decision makers and consumers actually know that the medicines exist. We shouldn't assume that because all of us know that these products are available that others know. It actually takes quite a lot of effort to spread the word so that people know the products actually exist. And then we need to actually educate these decision makers and consumers on the real benefits and advantages of the new formulations that Sharice noted earlier. We know that these formulations will greatly facilitate the treatment of pediatric TB, and we should really use this opportunity to garner even more political will to treat children and elevate treatment goals and expectations. Finally, there are scenarios when procurement policies can be utilized to quickly increase demand for these products. Donors and other third-party payers have the ability to mandate or encourage the use of these improved formulations. And the Global Fund has had great success in using this policy lever, for example, when they mandated purchase of malaria treatments in only fixed dose combination formulations. The same type of an approach could be used now that we have 
the optimal product for pediatric TB. Second, we need to ensure there's adequate financing to purchase these new formulations. We need to advocate for appropriate financing in countries who are funding their own programs, and we need to support those countries who receive global fund financing as they work through budget reallocation or reprogramming. And again, because countries will have to go through some type of reallocation or reprogramming exercise, this offers an incredible opportunity to revisit the pediatric TB treatment targets. And the Global Fund's TB Situation Room is an effective means to monitor progress towards targets and provide support as countries work to reach higher targets. For countries that will soon be transitioning from Global Fund financing to their own domestic financing, we need to work with them to make sure that they will continue to purchase these improved formulations even when they move away from Global Fund financing. And finally, securing additional funding to provide bridge grants to countries for the initial conversion to the new formulations could have dramatic impact on the rate at which these products get to children in need. So once we've managed to generate demand and secure financing, we'll need to support countries in the adoption of these products. And support should include the provision of technical assistance and capacity building, to revise pediatric treatment guidelines, effectively manage the phase out of the old formulations and the phase in of the new formulations, and help countries to quantify and forecast their treatment needs. This type of support can take many forms, including individual targeted missions to countries who are looking to adopt these products, mobilizing in-country partners, such as uh, the ones that Sharice noted earlier, KNCV, Challenge TV, uh, WHO, and others, who can provide follow-up and ongoing support, and the provision of regional and country workshops and training for people working in TB treatment programs, partners, and consultants. So once the country is ready, the next step is really to simply procure the medicines. And these new pediatric formulations are available for purchase through the Global Drug Facility, and I've provided uh, information on how to um, contact the Global Drug Facility in order to purchase these, these drugs. So the fifth and final set of activities really has to do with active market monitoring and management. The pediatric TB medicines market is very small and very fragile. As such, it's not easy to attract new suppliers into the market. That's essentially why the TB Alliance was given this grant in order to provide incentives and support to bring a manufacturer into the market. Now that that's done, we need systems to actively monitor and coordinate both the demand and supply sides of the market to make sure that we have consistent, uninterrupted supplies of medicines in countries and to ensure that we're not wasting medicines. We know from active management of other similar small markets, it'll be critical to have reliable and timely forecasts that can be communicated to manufacturers to inform their production planning. We also know that we need to consolidate the number of formulations used in pediatric TB to the fewest number possible. When you have a very small market, it's critical to keep the number of formulations to the smallest number possible that still allows for good clinical treatment of the children. We also need to coordinate or pool our procurement. And here we could think about establishing a pediatric TB procurement working group that's similar to the one that's been very successful in coordinating the procurement of pediatric medicines for HIV. We should also think about keeping a central stockpile of medicines. At the GDF, we have such a stockpile, and this has been really important, and it allows us to respond immediately to emergency orders when countries have them, and reduce lead times for regular orders. While we're happy to have the first supplier in this market, we should actively 
identify and attract an, at least one additional supplier to produce these formulations, and develop interventions to further decrease prices to make these products affordable but at a sustainable price. And finally, if we're doing all this work, we should really actively monitor and, and evaluate the introduction of this product so we can share lessons learned with all stakeholders so we can continuously improve new product introduction and make sure products get to the highest number of people as quickly as possible. So the GDF, the Global Drug Facility, has lots of experience across all of these areas. And again, we're very excited to see the launch of these new pediatric formulations. We stand ready to support countries as they move to introduce these products. The GDF sees itself as a one-stop shop for all TB medicines and diagnostics. And in addition to the procurement of products, we can also provide a considerable amount of technical assistance and capacity building in the area of supply chain management. We're uniquely positioned to support new product introduction, and we're currently playing a key role in the introduction of bedaculin, a new drug used for the treatment of MDR-TB. And GDF will continue to conduct its market management and coordination activities to ensure these medicines are readily available to those who need them. So finally, thanks again for the opportunity to be part of this webinar and thanks uh, to the TB Alliance for um, running such a successful project that got us this greatly needed formulation and ahead of schedule. Uh, thank you, Brenda, for a very inspiring presentation. Uh, I, I was really taken off. Uh, Luchika, I think, is having some uh, technical glitches there. She's in Tokyo right now, and uh, but uh, probably she came online and then she says that she cannot uh, connect, reconnect again. So meanwhile, we will begin with our question and answer session. Uh, participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand. You will be seeing on your screen. Uh, we already have a few questions with us. Uh, a person from Nepal wants to know, Brenda, what is the shelf life uh, of these new ch uh, child-friendly formulations? Do they need a cold chain? And what will be the cost as of now of a six-month treatment if uh, the medicine is taken through the GDF? Thanks very much. Um, so I'm just to say, uh, we're getting this information from the TB Alliance, so thanks to them for providing this. But they've told us that the shelf life is, is two years. There is no cold chain requirement uh, because it's a, um, a dispersible uh, tablet. And the price per um, complete treatment for the two phases will depend on the weight band, of course, of the child, because there's four weight bands. And I can uh, turn this over to Sharice if she wants to add something. Uh, but basically, for the lowest weight band, you're at around $16. And for the highest weight band, you're at around $64. That's without the ambutol. But Sharice, I don't know if you want to, to comment on that. Sharice, would you like to say something? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. I thought you had muted me, but anyway, um, yes, it, it's correct. Uh, so we're we're very happy that this um, that the introduction price is uh, 15. Average price for treatment is 15 dollars and uh, 54 cents. Um, and yes, the the products are easily you know administered. Uh, there's uh, they come in different pack size um, through the GDF. So each pack size is an 84 um, uh, 84 tablet uh, pack um, that includes uh, I think um, it's in a three by 28 strips. Um, and so it's 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 packaged in, in a way that I think. Um, will facilitate um, countries procuring it through the GDF, um, but we can 
uh, give any more details that you need on specific attributes of the products. Um, the flavors are raspberry and strawberry. Um, so the three drug, I believe, I'm not sure which one is which, but I, uh, I think the three drug is raspberry and the two drug is strawberry. Thank you, Sharice. Uh, Peter from Kenya wants to know, uh, what are the regulatory protocols for registration or approval of new drugs? Are they different for different countries? Is it easy to register new drugs in uh, low TB burden countries as compared to high TB burden countries? How, how do they vary from country to country? Uh, well, uh, I, can, I can take a stab at that. So it is different country to country, um, and there are various mechanisms uh, that countries can utilize to get the drugs. Um, but there's also, so we're working with countries very closely just to kind of understand how best we can get the products into country as soon as possible. So there's a regular process within countries, but there's also expedited ways of getting products as quickly as possible, especially for public health needs such as this. Um, and so it is a conversation with each country, but the global drug facility, getting products through them because they're under the UN, um, the United Nations kind of umbrella, allows for a mechanism to, to accelerate that in, in many countries. So that's one benefit um, of having a, a supplier such as the global drug facility. Um, and then there's other um, mechanisms where countries have to actually uh, add their own approval uh, as well. Um, and so we're just working with each country to figure out the best way for them because um, there, there are multiple options. Okay. Thank you. I think Kenya has already committed to rolling out the drugs as soon as uh, they are available in the market. I, I think that is what the uh, National TV Program Manager from Kenya promised at the conference. So, that is correct. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, Rajat Gupta from Chennai wants to know, are there any patent related or IP related obstacles you foresee? Brenda, question for you. Any patent related or uh, IP related obstacles you foresee? Um, I think I'll turn that one over to Sharice. I mean, the, the, the drugs themselves are not patented. Um, and Sharice, I don't know if there's a, a patent on the actual formulation of the McLeod's FDC. Um, but even if there were, there's enough know how that. that you know, all the Indian manufacturers know how to produce a product like this, and none of the individual drugs are, are patented. That, that is correct. Um, you know, I think each manufacturer does have, you know, um, some IP, but I think within our agreements with all manufacturers, there's a commitment to ensure that they're supplied to the to the elite, for definitely the public sector, and so we don't foresee that there will be any issues around that. Uh, I request the participants once again to please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand, which you will be seeing on the screen. Uh, I find Sumita Thapar who raising her hand. She is CNS special correspondent and also an, right now an independent journalist from UK. Uh, Sumita, you want to ask your question? Yes, Sumita. Uh, I don't know what to ask. I sent the question on chat. Would, would you like to ask the question? Right. So uh, the last slide that actually is, um, uh, spoke, you know, like how uh, a child with MDR has a, you know, a, a daily dose is a handful of drugs. So I just wanted to know a bit more on that. Uh, you're talking about the, the second line drugs? Um, so the last slide in your presentation just showed that, you know, like a, uh, the daily dose for a child with MDR TB, and it showed that, you know, there's a handful of drugs that the child has to take. So just wanted to know a bit more on that. Yeah, the, the, the treatment for MDR um, is very laborious and very toxic and very um, hard for not just, you know, children but adults as well. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons we really need new regimens and new drugs um, because of that. Um, and we need new formulations, especially um, for the drugs that are used in second line that we will use in, in newer regimens. So uh, I think that's um, something that needs further discussion and investigation of how best to do to improve the treatment for for uh, for children with MDR. But it is a, a it is very terrible on the ground when you really have to um, to see children have to go through that many um, to go through that much um, to be treated for for this disease. Um, and it's 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 very hard. Uh, you have injection. You don't just have oral drugs. You have injectables. You have um, drugs that are very bitter. There are no child formulations for MDP second line drugs. Um, so that is a a a, a need that is um, that is there uh, currently. Uh, it's my duty to keep on reminding the participants. Please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand you see on the screen. Meanwhile, we have another question from Sumita. She wants to know if we have child-friendly antiretrovirals in the market. She refers to some report that says that CIPLA has started manufacturing these last June. Wait, child-friendly what? Uh, antiretrovirals, ARVs. I think they're, uh, I, I'm not, so uh, Brenda, do you know? I'm sorry. Yeah, these have been on the market for quite some time. Uh, it's been several years that there have been um, fixed dose combination products for um, for HIV for children. Yeah. So these are 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 not are not new. Uh, they've been readily available for I don't know at least five six years. Okay. Uh, I think Daniel Datico wants to ask a question. Uh, meanwhile, uh, just for a moment, I think Luchika is online. Luchika, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, so we will just stop. Hello? Uh, to have... Hello, yes, we can hear you, Luchika. So we will just stop uh, our question and answer session for the moment. And I welcome Luchika to, to be there. She is the Executive Director of Stop TV Partnership. Lujika, over to you. We can hear you. Thank you, and I hope you can hear me. You yes, can? We can hear. Yes, we can. Oh, thank you so much. So I'm really, really sorry for this, Hika. First, uh, let me uh, thank you, Bobby and Shobna, for uh, making this webinar. And I think it's very timely, and it's not just this one that you are doing, but I think this one is very uh, timely. And I'm sorry for all the difficulties, actually. We especially booked the room here in Tokyo where there is a, you know, the Universal Health Coverage Conference and, you know, I'll be tomorrow in the panel speaking about the Universal Health Coverage and one of the things that I want to say is that TB is a very good proxy for where we are in terms of access to uh, health care and uh, especially looking at the vulnerable groups and especially looking at children. The fact that we are uh, at the beginning in a way of ensuring that they are properly identified, you know, tested, diagnosed, and then treated. Uh, it's a signal that we are on the right path, as you, I think, rightly said in the description of the webinar, but, you know, we are not yet there. And I know that you had a very rich conversation, and uh, my colleagues uh, kept me in the loop with what's going on, and I was extremely frustrated of not being able to link up from Tokyo <laughs> on Internet, but anyway. Um, so... Uh, on the fact that, uh, you see, uh, we, we have a long way to go in terms of, um, in terms of children. And uh, uh, the long way is uh, the fact that uh, we, uh, on one hand, as, uh, as we all say, it's important we, we are focusing more on children. Uh, more and more countries are identifying children as an important area of interest. Uh, more and more programs, applications to the Global Fund and other donors are speaking about TB in children. But actually on the ground, the coverage and the take-up uh, is not as much as it should be. So we have a lot uh, to go for it. And we have now a good combination, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a step forward, but it's not the, the only step. Diagnosis is still complicated. Uh, we don't have a vaccine. And 
more important than is uh, the fact that we need to reach these children, we need to find them. And as you know, it's very difficult even for adults to ensure their access to the, the, to the treatment, to ensure their access to being, uh, you know, being identified and, and so on. So in that part of the recommendations of WHO, we a lot of efforts in the in the coming years in order to make sure that we put uh, all of these pieces into uh, into one and that we are able then to further uh, you know basically it's it's you can have the best services in a, you know we dis I discussed here with the minister of Malawi and uh, you know he was saying that the, the the access of people to the services that are in place is extremely extremely difficult and it's extremely costly and that's why he needs to think in a way in which is constructive and is making sure that his budget is used in a proper way to ensure that those that are the most vulnerable groups, the most difficult to find, the most difficult to keep on treatment, uh, children between being one of them, uh, you know, are, are having the, the, the right access and the chance to get tested and then further diagnosed and then further treated. So. I know that you discussed a lot about uh, the new formulation, and I think it's a it's a very important conversation, and that's why we said that we because we care so much about uh, TB and Stop TB partnership since the beginning, uh, at least since I joined in 2011. Uh, but I think even before was really pushing the agenda towards uh, you know including children. I think there is a, an important piece of work that we have to do. Uh, in the Stop TV partnership, I know Brenda was there from the GDF, and uh, I know there is uh, an ongoing conversation around this on what we can do. But the other thing that we will do, as I promised, uh, uh, you know, in the launch of the Global Plan and to the board, is that we will monitor on how the Global Plan is pushing forward the agenda. And as children are so important, I think in the next out of step report that we will do together with MSF, we will have to include some of the policies related to the children contact screening and diagnosis and treatment because you know irrespective of what is requested at the global level in terms of children you know even if it is not requested to report the cases if the ministers of health are not aware and are not realizing how important and what a, what an indicator of a failing program or of a big transmission to be in children is they will never take the right measures so we need to be in the face of ministers and we need to be with a foot in the countries beyond the region and beyond the global level. So I will stop here and I'm really sorry for this mess with my connection. Hello? 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 Okay. Yeah, I, I finished. I finished. Did you okay, hear me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Luchika. Thank you so much. I'm reminding the participants once again to please see, keep sending your questions using chat function or raising your virtual hand. Meanwhile, we are proud to have as one of our, amongst our participants, uh, we are proud to have Daniel Jatiko, who was the Fortune Prize winner at the 45th Union World Conference on Lung Health in Barcelona. We are very happy to have him here with us. He is the Executive Director of Reach Ethiopia and has a question to ask as well. The question is, is there any mechanism to make sure high burden countries get it on board to make the drugs available and within reach of children? How can we ensure high burden countries to get the drug on board? Um, for, I'll, I'll answer if um, no one else has a comment. Um, I, I think this is Sharice. Um, so one of the things is from the very beginning, it was engaging countries and, and really talking with them, making them aware of the availability of these products. I think and that, that they were coming um, and when they were available, making sure they had all the information they needed uh, to, to really plan and make uh, preparations to transition to these new products. And so those discussions have been going on with all the high burden countries 
that um, were willing to to participate, and that's actually the quite a, the majority of them. Um, and so we're we're actively talking with them and engaging them with, with all our partners um, to really ensure. And you would. Uh, we're, we're very hopeful that a lot of the countries, as soon as it's possible for them, based on, you know, there's a few things, steps that need to happen, including ensuring that their budget is there and, show, like, some of the things that Brenda outlined, there are some steps that need to happen, but countries are actively moving towards getting the drugs as soon as possible. Daniel, any more questions to come from you? Would you like to ask something else? Uh, I request thank you very much. participants to please. Yes, yes, please. Yes, we can hear you, Daniel, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. What I meant to say is is, is there any uh, country, uh, country based commitment which is really expressed? Otherwise, the drugs might not be reaching down to the people or children in need. The express need at the level of high policymakers. Um, you, you said explicit um, actual commitment. Yes. Um, so, so yes. Yeah. So there are countries that, if you look at their uh, global fund grants, if you look at their policies, uh, they've changed their guidelines to accommodate the new products, including the new products in their policies and national strategic plans. Um, they've included them in their, their funding mechanisms already. A lot of countries already have an allocation for pediatric products. It's just a matter of um, uh, uh, there are other variables that may need to happen depending on the country. So yes, there are firm commitments from a lot of countries to actually procure these products. Um, they have budgets or they have within their planning, you know, strategic plans. Uh, to to utilize these products, so um, we're very it's very promising on that front. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Fatima from Bangladesh, uh, and she says, "What about children under six months of age who are supposed to be exclusively breastfed, and we do have children as young as two three months old who get TB, even MDR TB." What is the policy in case of for case of such children? As far as I know, um, the products can be administered to at least children five. The recommendations cover five kilograms and above. Um, although we do know young children are being treated with TB. Um, with these products, but we're in the process of trying to make sure and clarify the guidelines for those under five kilograms. Um, and so that's in process, and, and we just need more evidence on the, on the youngest. Um, so I think we're, we're working towards that, but unfortunately um, there are no set guidelines yet for those under five in the smallest weight band, or so the youngest babies. We are still waiting for participants to send in more questions through the chat function or by raising your virtual hand, which you must be seeing on your screen. Of course, the webinar recording will be made will be online uh, once we get over with it. But uh, we are just waiting for a few more questions. Uh, there is one question from uh, Philippines that what have been the experience of rolling out delaminate and bedaculate in high burden countries? What have been the roadblocks and still are the roadblocks in making access to them easier for people in need of them? So um, this is Brenda here. Um, we've had uh, Recent success with the rollout of Bedaculin. Um, we're eagerly awaiting an active rollout of Delaminid. Um, you probably know that last year, uh, this past year, USAID announced a donation program for Bedaculin. 
that allows for 30,000 treatments of bedaquiline over four years. And they uh, mandated that that bedaquiline program be managed through the Global Drug Facility. So we've been working closely with USAID as well as uh, a task force that um, brings together all kinds of stakeholders at national and global level um, to work together to make sure that we get bedaquiline to people as quickly as possible. Because it's a donation program, the price obviously is not a barrier at all. The barrier has been, um, as I presented in my slides, uh, first making people aware that the product actually is available and how to obtain it. And then um, even more difficult is actually, you know, um, doing what's needed in country in order to incorporate the baraquiline into uh, new treatment regimens. Uh, the WHO has five different criteria that they um, mandate must be in place in order to use baraquiline. And that has uh, really been the rate limiting step in getting countries to uh, start using baraquiline. But in the first six months of, of the um, donation program, there have been more than 30 countries who have requested bedaquiline for about 2,000 patients. So as of the last month or so, it's really started to pick up in terms of numbers, and we hope that we will see uh, those numbers continue to increase in 2016 even more rapidly. Um, we are hoping and expecting that uh, delaminated, delaminated will be commercially available uh, in 2016, and we would expect to use the, the same type of a platform with the task force, with the Global Fund TB Situation Room that Luchika can speak to, uh, and with the GDF mechanism to really uh, support the uh, product rollout for delaminate as well. Uh, thank you. Luchika, you want to say something? Luchika, are you there? Okay. Uh, meanwhile, Sumita Thapar, independent journalist from UK and also special correspondent CNS, wants to ask another question. So, uh, Sumita, would you like to ask the question yourself? Right. So, uh, I'd like to know why did it take so long to develop child-friendly TV drugs? So I think, this is Brenda, I, it's a really good question and it gets back to um, you know, the point that I was making in my presentation and that is there, there aren't any incentives because uh, manufacturers don't make uh, a lot of profit and there's a lot of risk involved in making pediatric formulations. And this one was especially challenging because the reality is the WHO guidelines for pediatric uh, TB were such that there were never actual uh, formulations available to provide the doses that WHO was recommending. Therefore, in addition to being a low volume, low profit um, market, it was unclear what the regulatory pathway would be if a manufacturer decided to step in and produce um, this type of a formulation that actually meets WHO guidelines in terms of the appropriate dosing. And that was a real barrier because um, it, it wasn't clear what the process was or what it would cost. And so you have to think about the barriers at the global level to get um, approval from a strict regulatory authority like the WHO pre-qualification program. You have to conduct a lot of tests and supply a lot of data in order to, um, to get their approval. And because this was the first of its sort, there was no historical 
guideline that would say this is exactly what you need to do and this is what it will cost. So there wasn't really a willingness for uh, a manufacturer to step in and the same for countries because as one of the participants asked earlier a very good question about what are the barriers in country on, in terms of regulation and registration, there are barriers. And some countries are actually requiring for uh, studies to be done in their own country in order to register because there is no other product like this. And uh, that has a cost as well. So I think that was the big reason why Unitaid decided a donor needed to come in and actually provide the incentives that would attract new manufacturers into the market because otherwise it would never happen organically. It's too low profit and there are too many unknowns that could actually turn this into a big loss for companies. Okay, thank you. Sherry's, would you like to add something to that? Because we have been seeing, seeing TB Alliance working so hard in this direction uh, to get yeah. this done. Yeah, and I think early early on um, that we really had to understand what were the barriers around the regulatory and what were the options um, for really getting drugs into countries and even in countries now especially with the launch and the information going out I think even some of the countries that were having some more challenging regulatory pathways are reconsidering and trying to see what are some more fast-track mechanisms they can utilize to get the drugs to country. So I think countries uh, are rethinking some things and really trying to understand because they do see the importance of getting these products. Um, but uh, that is one thing too that we really need to work on, um, not just for TV, but for a lot of these public health emergencies is to really find better ways um, and more accelerated ways of getting quality drugs to, to the, the patients in countries. And so that's trying to find more harmonized, harmonized pathways. The WHO has a collaborative review process that helps um, countries uh, you know, get a hold of pre-qualified dossiers and then therefore be able to review more quickly um, and make a decision on products. There are other efforts in Asia around, you know, more joint reviews. So I think there are a lot of initiatives that are trying to come forward to try to address these regulatory hurdles. Thank you, Sherry. We just have about uh, one and a half minutes left. So participants, please send your questions quickly using chat function or by raising your virtual hand, which you must be seeing on your screen. We just we have very little time left, so requesting for more questions from the participants. We'll just give them a little more time to get their act done. No more questions, it seems. Uh, so, a very big thank you to all our panelists. We had an ex excellent presentations, and thank you, Lushika, also for being able to join us eventually. The webinar recording will be streamed on the YouTube channel of CNS, so everyone can hear it. And 